there. Uh, it's so good to see you. Uh, it's been it's been terrific uh, being here in Pittsburgh. I'm Tom Guariello, um, and I say it's been terrific to be here in Pittsburgh because I've uh, spent a long, big chunk of my life here in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's uh, an adopted home for me. I was born and raised in the Bronx, but uh, ended up going to graduate school here at Duquesne, get my PhD in psychology, and lived here in Pittsburgh from like, in 71 to 1989, first four ranks. We're here, loved it, here for the first four. Um, then had to wait 27 more years for the thumb. I still have my one for the thumb in 81 t-shirt, which uh, haunted me for all those years. Um, and uh, moved on from being in Pittsburgh as a psychologist and uh, always loved technology very early on in the, in the technological development uh, of computers that didn't have people with lab coats, you know, real people using computers, and um, ended up becoming an organizational consultant. So now I'm a, a principal and since you start the firm, you can call yourself anything you want. So I'm chief idea officer of a firm called True Talk Consulting. And what we do is to help our clients to figure out how to connect with everybody they need to connect with effectively to create the kind of results that they have to uh, create. And it's uh, a very exciting time to be doing that kind of work because of everything that we, we know is happening in the world today. And I wanted to... Um, I wanted to start just by giving you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. First thing I'm going to do is talk about the history of social media. Secondly, why do we do this? I mean, as a psychologist, I'm always kind of interested in why do people do the kinds of things that we do? What's the meaning of what it is that we're doing? Next, um, how do we do this? What, you know, what's, what is it about the media that's informative to us as we look through the lens of social media? Next, a little bit about the messages that we send through social media. And finally, something about the who. Who, who is me in the social media world? Um, so that's kind of an overview of, of what I'm going to talk about. And I wanted to start by asking you a question. How many of you have a Twitter blog, video blog, or any other kind of content creating account on the internet? Raise your hands. Hi, please. Leave your hands up if you have more than one of those. Raise your hand up if you have more than two of those. If you have more than three. Well, what we see is that we are a um, multimedia production group. We produce content across a lot of different media, and that is the way the world is developing now, isn't it? We are all multimedia content producers. And I'm one of those. I started my blog in 2004. And uh, next thing I did was to get fascinated by YouTube. I thought YouTube was something that was really transformative in the way people connected with one another. So very early on, in very early 2006, I got on, uh, involved in YouTube, ended up becoming a, a part of YouTube's first community council to try to create some kind of dialogue between the users of the, of the service and the owners of the service. In early 2006, I started podcasting because that was something else that was important that was starting to happen. And in, early, in late 2006, very early on in its development, I, I was lucky enough to get on Twitter in a very early beta of Twitter and started seeing that movement and seeing what was happening. And all of this was a way to for me to try to help our clients, our corporate clients, to understand what was going on in the lives of their customers and in their lives of their employees. You know, very often corporations talk about connecting with their customers and sometimes connecting with their suppliers. But you know, when you work in a corporation today, you're living in a multimedia world. Sometimes your corporation doesn't live in a multimedia world, but you live in a multimedia world. So that's part of what we do is to try to help our our clients to understand that. Now, how did we get here in social media? How did, we, how did this happen? So uh, Marshall McLuhan is somebody who has spoken uh, in, in, uh, in the mid-20th century, spoke a lot about 
the meaning of media and how media has affected our lives. And now McLuhan is one of those people who when you read McLuhan, you see, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, the medium is the message. What does that mean? What the, he's, he, was a, he was one of these people who didn't write as well as he spoke. So he, uh, his writing is sometimes very enigmatic and very difficult. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on McLuhan, but there is, uh, uh, he was important, and he's important enough to, to, to know as an influence in, uh, in, in social media. So let's take a look at the history of social media, and we're going to get with uh, Mr. Peabody here and uh, Sherman, and we're going to get into the Wayback Machine, right? and we're going to go back, and we're going to go back and do 32,000 years of social media history in six minutes, all right? Here we go. So imagine this, it's, it's 32,000 years ago and you're part of a tribe, maybe 100, 150 people wearing what we wore 150, uh, 32,000 years ago and you're out hunting and gathering and doing all those things all day and then you come back, you're living in the south of Spain and you come back to your cave and one night, you're looking around, and somebody gets up and walks over to the wall and starts to do this. Starts to draw things on the, on the wall. And you, you know, you look and you say, well, gee, that's interesting. Things, that, the person is drawing and painting. 32,000 years ago, and of course, we have evidence that there are quite a few of these caves all through Spain and through France. So 32,000 years ago, people were already trying to do something about, here's what I did today. Here's what I did today. I was out hunting, <laughs> and I saw this big animal, and I got him with a spear, 32,000 years ago. But fast forward about 24,000 years, and, and now we're in, a, in a, another cave. We've lived in caves for a long time. We're in another cave, but only this time, we've already started to develop some agriculture. So we're, we're staying put a little more than we did before. We're staying in this one place, and now this cave, what I'm putting on the, on the wall of this cave is not so much a story of what I did today, but it's a map. This is a map of our town. This is the first map that anyone can point to and say, yes, that is an actual map of a town in Turkey that someone decided we better put a map here <laughs> so that people know where everybody lives. You don't know zip codes, but you know they're on it. They are definitely on uh, mapping their territory. 8,000 years ago, they're doing that. Also about 8,000 years ago, instead of being local and just kind of drawing things on the wall, somebody said, I know, you know how we sit around and we sing sometimes and we hit things? And we, I'm going to make a big drum, and I'm going to make this drum big enough so that I can see it, and that you can hear it, all over town. And so this is the first drum that anybody can point to as being excavated about uh, 8,000 years ago in Central Europe. So now we have... People drawing pictures, you have people making maps, and now we have people essentially using audio to communicate with, with each other back then, 8,000 years ago. 3,500 years ago, we developed cuneiform writing. We start to, to write on these tablets, on these clay tablets, and these are mostly transactions that are being recorded then. Now we've pretty much developed agriculture and we've developed some commerce. These are merchants who are writing down, who are recording, these are receipts that they were writing down on these clay tablets saying, okay, I bought this much grain and this is how much somebody paid for it, 3500 BCE. So long time ago, big moment of course when we've transformed now into writing instead of just symbols and pictures. Another step forward, about 4,000 years ago, the first recorded story, this is Gilgamesh, the story of Gilgamesh, in uh, this tablet, these, these, this tablet was found in Iraq, about 4,000, what is now Iraq, from about 4,000 years ago. This is a, a very early uh, Noah's Ark tale. And so here we have now not just a, a, a a loose symbolic story, but a very detailed telling of a story that someone has figured out was important and to pass along to their fathers. Now, let, let's, let's move on quickly. We've now jumped to the, the Americas, and here we see the use of smoke signals to communicate, and that's you know somewhere around 4, 000, about 2,000 years ago, started, and you know coming up to just a couple of hundred years ago, long distance communication basically starting to come into play using these very simple binary kinds of ways of communicating with one another across distances. So again, an important step. Anybody know what this is? Pony Express. Is it the Pony Express? 
it's, it's, <laughs> that's a good, that's a good guess. This is actually the first photograph that anyone can point to and say, this is a photograph. Now, it's an odd photograph, though, isn't it? You look at it and you say, well, what is it a photograph? It's actually a photograph of a lithograph. So the first photograph recorded was essentially a copyright infringement, right? I mean, somebody <laughs> <laughs> took this picture, and they, this is, in 1825, the first photograph that anyone can point to and say, yes, that's a real photograph. Of course, photography made a huge impact in terms of a, of a media. What we start to see happening now is that media begin to build on themselves. This is, a, of course, a huge transformation in 1861. We have the telegraph coming, uh, coming live. Now, the telegraph using electricity to communicate over long distances was magic, essentially, for, for people. The fact that we could do this um, was uh, it, it, it changed everything about the way people thought about distance, about themselves, about others. So this ushered in the last 150 years of real time, long distance communication. And so it's only been 150 years that we have had this idea that we could communicate with anybody, anywhere, now, by using some kind of device. Now, if we see up to now, the people who are using these devices are pretty specialized. You know, when you see the movies and the, the telegraph people, you have to go to the telegraph office and you have to do that. So we're still using specialists to do this long distance, real time communication, but it is possible. Until 1876, when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, and now we start to see how electricity comes into play, not just as we saw it with the telegraph, but now on the telephone, we see that we are starting to be able to, to communicate with one another by voice. First time we were ever able to communicate by voice. Look at what happened. Within 15 years after the development of the telephone, after the invention of the telephone, we went from this scene of New York City, a lower Manhattan street, to this rendering of that same street. Look at the adoption rate of that technology. People couldn't wait to get telephones. And they had to, we, of course, we couldn't all have our own number. We had to have party lines. But we were dying, dying to get this device into our house to be able to communicate with one another. This is purported to be not the first film, but the second film recorded. Take a look at this movie. You can see that this is the, the content is pretty interesting, isn't it? This is 1896. This was by Thomas Edison. Now, you know, I think this is an interesting little scene that we see happening here. Now, I want you to check this guy out. This guy is really smooth. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, uh, that movie called The Kiss is, wasn't the first movie, but it was the second one that people can find. And this is from Edison's catalog. He was a marketer par excellence. Look at that. Uh, they kiss, they kiss, they kiss, they kiss, in a way that brings down the house every time. So, you know, he knew, he knew that this movie was going to make a big impression on people and it was going to sell, which was what he was interested in doing. He was, he was a businessman. All right, so now we have films, right? Now, 1920, we have radio for the first time. Now, here at KDKA, right, a new word entered into our vocabulary, broadcasting. The word didn't exist before. Why? Because there, there was no way to get all that media prior to 1920, no way to get all that media actually into people's homes, to really get it close to them. You had to go to the movie theater, you had to go to the telegraph office, you had to do all these things. Suddenly now, here is that media right there in your home. And of course, radio became transformative of American culture, of global culture. But when you think about America and you think about what happened with radio, you think the political implications, the commercial implications, all of what happened as a result of everybody having one of these devices in their home. 30 years later, we had this device in the home. Here I am, my first television set. It's not really me. <laughs> it looked enough like me, like a line. So 1950, I had a set like this in about 1950. And it's impossible to talk about the impact that television has had on us as individuals and as a culture. It's so, it is so fundamental to the way we understand modern life today that television's transformation has been huge. Okay, 1959, why is this important? Well, this is the princess phone. Many of us remember the princess phone, right? Why is the princess phone important? For me, the princess phone is important because it used to be you had a phone, it was black. 
you dialed it. Now you can have your own kind of phone. You can have, you know, this was obviously geared to the female market, right? You can have your own phone, it can be pink, you can tailor your device to yourself. You could make it yours, you could own it, right? So we started to get, in, and remember now, as we take up these media, as we take up these inventions, we start to appropriate them as part of ourselves. Well, I don't want a black phone. I want this phone. I don't want, you know, I, I want what I want. Starts to become possible in the world of media. Same thing happened with cameras. Cameras have been around for a long time, right? But in 1963, the Instamatic meant I could have my camera, I could carry it in my pocket, take pictures whenever I want, had a flash on it. Now I was really a photographer. So suddenly, no longer the purview of the specialist, no longer just something you had to do, other people would do, you could do it yourself, and it was portable. 1965, we did the same thing with moving pictures. Right, the, the, the Super 8, the Canon Super 8, you see that, once again, home movies. People could take their own films of their own lives, they could record the things that they did every day, easily, simply, cheaply, we were there. 1969, the, this is the first di uh, uh, internet diagram. It was a four node internet. There it was, right there from uh, UCSB, and up here in uh, Palo Alto, and out there in Utah, and down here at UCLA. Four nodes, 1969, first virus, by the way, in 1980. Didn't take long <laughs> before the hackers started figuring out this was fun to do something with this. Of course, we can't, again, even begin to talk about the impact that the internet has had. Starting from there, now we have our own, we had our own in 1981, we were able to do high fidelity uh, recording with our VCRs of sound. Remember, those early Super 8s were pretty well uh, silent. We had our own video we could take. And then, of course, in 1981, we also had the, the uh, IBM PC with a 300 baud modem. I had one of these. So I bought my first uh, uh, computer in 1982. Had a three, like this one, no, no hard drive, dual floppies, but a 300 baud modem. Why, did, why was a 300 baud modem important? Because in 1982, these things came along CompuServe and AOL. Now, not only did I have a computer where I could do the things that I wanted to do, spreadsheets, which were magic, right, and word processing, which was also magic, but I could talk to other people in other places. Now, we all lived in these little walled gardens, as we call them today, but we all lived in these little communities, um, and, but we were happy in them. And by the way, Twitter didn't invent, you know, just kind of nonsensical, <laughs> meaningless little updates. We've been doing that for as long as we have been communicating with each other. I'm sure a lot of those early cave things that we saw and a lot of those early things we saw were, what are you doing? Oh, not too much, you know, just hanging out, you know, just went to lunch. Uh, so uh, AOL, CompuServe, by the way, in 1985, the well, this is now when people started to, the elite started to develop. This was uh, uh, the Whole Earth Electric uh, Link, which was started by Stuart Brand, who wrote the Whole Earth Catalog. Here's a guy who had, and by the way, still today, if you see somebody that has an email address that is at well.com, you know that you know they were, because you can't get one of those. They, they, they were the, one of some of the very earliest technology elites. So we were, we were finding ways to get out of the commercialized uh, networks of AOL and CompuServe and find some other kinds of networks. And of course, that exploded in 1995 with the browser. When the, when the Netscape Navigator hit in 1995, it changed everything because now, when I was on CompuServe, I could only send email and communicate with other people who were on CompuServe. But now I could communicate with anybody, anywhere who was on the internet thanks to this browser. This was another tremendous development. 1998, Blogger and Live Journal, so blogging started and we were seeing now people doing that same thing they had been doing for, for millennia, right? communicating what they're doing today, but only now it's in everybody's hands. Everybody is able to do that. 2000, broadband, of course we know what that did. It ushered in the age of these guys. Remember who that is? That's Adam Curry and uh, Dave Weiner. Dave Weiner, uh, the inventor of RSS, which is fundamental to so much of what we do on the internet. These guys developed podcasting and now suddenly we had people not just writing notes to one another, we had recording our own uh, shows. We were talking to one another on there. 
2004, this kid up in Cambridge decided to start this thing called the Facebook and uh, just use his Cambridge connections to have a, a, a list of who else was there at Harvard. 2005, these three guys decided that they could have a video community that could kick off. Um, and in 2006, we saw that the folks at Twitter could kick that off. So here we have 32,000 years of social media history leading to today and something that instead of broadcasting people are calling life casting so streaming our lives live to everybody who cares and some who don't out there onto the internet in all of these different media in all these different ways life casting really is ancient needs meeting modern technologies now, whenever we talk about needs, we have to talk about meaning. What is it, why are we doing this? What is it that makes this so important to us? And to do that, think about yourselves. You raised your hands about having all these channels that you use and I use for communicating why. Why do you and your audience, what do you want from social media? Well, whenever you want to think about what people want and about their needs. One of the things I always want to do is to go back to some of the early motivational theories, some of the strong motivational theories that have impacted on psychology. One of those is Abraham Maslow's uh, um, hierarchy of needs. And if you remember from Psych 101, uh, here we had physiological safety, belonging, self-esteem, and self-actualization needs. Maslow said these were in a hierarchy. We started at the bottom, we moved up to the top. And if you take a look at the ones up here at the top, these are what you can call social needs. These are the things that we really look to one another in order to get. Now, Maslow wasn't the only one who had an impact on, on motivation theory in the 20th century. There was uh, Abraham Maslow, I mean, there was uh, David McClellan, who didn't think so much in terms of a hierarchy. He thought in terms of a mix of needs, that there are these three basic clusters of needs, achievement, affiliation and power, and that those three mixed together are what drive us to our day-to-day our -day activities. Now, um, if you look at those and kind of overlay the two together, you can get this kind of a model. Belonging needs for affiliation, this is the desire to want to interact with one another and to have people like us and to influence other people. That's, the, that's the, that first set of belonging and affiliation needs. Self-esteem and power needs, well, this is the idea of wanting to have either personal power or institutional power, okay? so wanting to be a leader, be the leader. And third, self-actualization and achievement, wanting to accomplish goals. Now, all of us have all three of these sets of needs at work in us all the time. The question is the balance. What's our, what is our own particular balance of needs? And when you, you take a look at motives and needs, you see that motives shape our perceptions, thoughts, emotions, values, and behavior. This is, this is very important. When we look at the world, we typically think that the world is just there, right? It just kind of presents itself to us. But in fact, we look at the world through our motivational lenses, through the, and we see things, and we give value to things, and we act on things that are important to us. Now, you see that in terms of, in the social media world, you see it in terms of the social media choices that we make, and the kind of behavior that we exhibit when we're in social media. What kinds of things do we uh, do we find attractive? What kinds of things do we do once we get there? Let's take a look at, for example, the affiliation and belonging needs. If you have a desire to be in a lot of community kind of involvement, wanting to interact with a lot of people, wanting to get to know a lot of people, wanting to influence a lot of people, the chances are that you are going to be using your affiliation uh, needs most strongly. This is Vloggerhead's a, a video blogging community that I started a little over a year ago, uh, about 3,000 members who are very strongly affiliation uh, driven. These are people who wanted to find a place where they could interact with others like them in a relatively civil and friendly environment. Uh, and so these were people who were probably motivated by affiliation and belonging. 
Self-actualization achievement means if you find yourself going to places where you can get a lot of things accomplished and done, sites like Etsy, for example, where, where people who in the past were not able to get their work um, uh, seen and get that sense of self-actualizing accomplishment that comes from getting work recognized and perhaps even purchased are very much uh, motivated in this self-actualizing uh, achievement way. Oh. And finally, um, if, if power is a strong motive in your life, you're going to find yourself or you will see people who are very much wanting to, uh, to win. They are going to want to be the leaders. So when you see people who are follower happy, who are, who are interested in thousands and thousands of followers. Now, this, this is, remember, we all have this mix of needs. So it isn't that one is good and another is not good. It's the balance. And you will see that, for example, in, in the celebrity world, power is a very important part of their participation. The need for power is a very important part of their participation in social media. So remember. Why are we doing this? It's got something to do with our mix of needs. And you will discover for yourself, and you also discover in your followers, listeners, readers, uh, viewers, what their mix of needs is like. And you will find yourself um, interacting with them according to those need filters. People will say to you, you know, I would, I would rather if you did a little less of this and a little more of that. They're telling you something about their needs, and if that's coming across um, in, a, in a broad way, then you know that you're probably communicating to people who are, whose mix of needs is uh, more heavily on one of these three than on the others. Okay, how in, in media? Um, what media do you use? I mean, that we have now all of this media which we've seen develop over millennia. What media do you use? And I want to ask you a question. Uh, could you play Beethoven's Fifth Symphony on a whistle? You, you, you know, you, you could, right? You probably could, but it's much better to use the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, right? Much better to do that. I love this guy. He needs tickets. <laughs> I love that. Only in Pittsburgh with the Symphony Orchestra, I have a guy who has a sign that says, I need tickets. And, uh, and, and, you know, the reason that it's better to use the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra is that every medium has something that it's best at. Right? Every medium is best at something. Now, text is best at conveying information. Detailed, sometimes highly structured information. Text is great at that. Images, whether they're still or moving images, are great at capturing experience. Now, if you are interested in having people directly experience what you are trying to communicate, images are the best way to do that. Now, I have some sound here that unfortunately I see no way to actually plug in the orange, the orange tail, plug it in your audio. Plug in the orange to my audio. Yeah, that'll go over, that'll go over the room. That sounds great. Let's see if that works. Okay, so that's that's images. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. Audio is great. Best at intimacy. I chose Terry Gross's voice because for me, Terry Gross is one of those people whose voice immediately captivates me from a sense of intimacy. <clears throat> She's speaking directly to me. I like the feeling of intimacy that I get when she's speaking. Audio does that most effectively because it's plugged into those parts of our brain that really do plug into the intimacy aspects. So, now, if you're using one kind of medium today, then you are falling into this, if, ever, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail trap, right? Because Communicating with people across those three broad categories of media will give you much more flexibility in terms of the kinds of messages that you are going to communicate, the people who are going to resonate with those messages, uh, the enjoyment that you're going to get from, from using 
those three big categories of media. So, uh, so how we are using media today, this mix of media is what we're finding available to us and of course we're all using as much as we can. Some of us are a little reluctant to, uh, to take up some of them. I was an early video adopter. I never thought I would be an early video adopter. When I joined YouTube, I was a lurker. I said, I don't want to do any of this. I'm just going to watch and then talk to my clients about what I'm seeing, and that's going to be that. And what do I see? I see an 80-year-old man sitting in a cabin, a cabin, a, 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 a cottage, in the Midlands of England, a, a, a man whose name is Peter Oakley, who uh, used the handle geriatric1927. And I see Peter online telling stories about his life. And I say, I, I can't believe this. This guy is fantastic. Like this, this, this man is amazing. I have to do this. <laughs> about 600 videos later now online, I have learned that using video is a very important way that you can connect with other people. It takes practice, however, and it takes that kind of courage that it takes to be able to overcome that initial, oh my God, do I really look like that <laughs> kind of experience. <laughs> so that's uh, the mix of me. Where are you? Good. Okay. Um, so, so what? What are the messages? What, what's the message that we're talking about? Here we have McLuhan with, with um, let's try it again. McLuhan said, with telephone and TV, it's not so much the message, but the sender that is sent. Now, this was a new idea that, in fact, the, the, the content of the message was important, but not nearly as important as the sender. And I think that if McLuhan were alive today, he would say the same thing about social media. And in social media, very much of what is being said is me. And people are responding or not responding to me in that experience. Now, if the message is me, what kind of sender succeeds in social media? Here we have some, some uh, famous communicators, right? And, and people who you would think are excellent senders of messages, and they are. Uh, do you know who this is, by the way, down here? Richard Branson. Richard Branson in, a, a, in, in drag, in a, in a, in a bridal gown. I, I just thought that was, you know, one of, the, one of those images that captures the way that people have decided that they can present themselves to the world nowadays. Very different than, you know, Winston Churchill and uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So what kind of, what kind of uh, sender is likely to succeed? Well, the most important aspect of your social media engagement and your social media presence needs to be <coughs> likability. Likability, the more likable candidate has won every election since, every presidential election since 1960. That simple question, who do you like better? This one or this one determines who's going to win, right? So that's a pretty astounding thing. It's very important to be likable. How, how do you be likable? What does it take to be likable? Well, likability means all of these things and more, but being positive, friendly, open, non-judgmental, vulnerable, real, but most importantly, like me. People like, we like people who are like ourselves. Now, what it means to be like ourselves can vary greatly if you want to be like someone who is exactly like you, 62-year-old, white male, lives in Connecticut, and those are the only people that you like, then that's all you're going to like. But if you like people who are able to connect with their experiences, be open and real, and be vulnerable, and listen to you, and learn something from you, that's probably going to make you more like someone like me than, than other people, right? You're, you, know, you have more people that you can be like if you are open to this kind of presence. So number one, if you don't remember anything else, be likable. In whatever medium you're using, be likable, right? Number two, engaging. We, we want engaging interactions with people. 
What does that mean? It means we want people who are, we want to I interact with people who are approachable. They're interesting, right? They're informative. They have something to say, and they say it in a way that makes us feel comfortable with them, engaging. Be surprising. Surprising people, we, we come back to things that are surprising because we don't know what's going to happen next. I listen to Terry Gross because one day she's going to interview uh, uh, a rock star, and the next day she's going to interview a politician. She surprises me with her range. I, not, I don't know what's what I'm going to get, but I do know that it's going to be in that likable Terry Gross kind of manner. So surprising, very important, again, of, along with being engaged. Emotional, we want to experience people who are authentically passionate about the things that they're addressing. We, 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 that's what, make us, what makes us distinctive. The fact that our, it's not just information that you're conveying to people, it's something about your way of experiencing your life, and that includes your emotional life, and it includes being able to communicate that. So don't be afraid to be emotional. Doesn't matter if the emotions that you're describing are not positive emotions. They are your emotions, and as long as they are authentic and you are passionate about them, people will resonate with the fact that you are being legitimately, authentically emotional with them. We, efficient is very important. We live in a time when, it, you know, I, I think my first videos, the first, I'm going to say the first 50 videos I made averaged eight minutes. Averaged eight minutes. I can go on, as you can tell. I can go on, and so I would, I would just sit there and I'd say, yeah. And then I thought about this and I thought about that, and and then I realized, you know, the people who are making the two-minute videos <laughs> seem to be engaging more conversation with people than me in my eight-minute videos. I, maybe I'm going to try. Well, if fish, and that of course has just become more important now that we are in this world of Twitterizing. We must Twitterize, be succinct, and Twitterize what you're saying. Uh, I, I can't repeat that often enough. Twitterize it. Make it short, punchy, get to the point, get in, get out. Efficient. Being a storyteller is what all this is about, right? We saw going back to the cave, what, was he, what, what, was, what were those early artists doing? Uh, he and she were, point, were painting their stories on the wall. And, and stories are what bind us together. Stories are repeating, repeatable, they're meaningful, they're sticky. Stories are timeless. So the, the more you can frame whatever you're doing in a story format, the more memorable it's going to be. The more people are going to be able to say, you know, I heard a story about this guy, and storytelling. All of that is going to combine to make you persuasive. Look, we're all trying to persuade people of something. That's why we're creating this material. I want to persuade you that my political view is, a, is a, a sounder political view than someone else's. I want to convince you that the best way to make this pasta sauce is this way. I, I want to persuade you of that because I want you to try it because I know you're going to love it if you try it. That we're all trying to be persuasive. So persuasive means that we're going to be trusted, we're going to be influential, we're going to be credible, all of that is the sum total of all these other things that we've looked at that have led up to this point. Okay, so we've got the what being the mix of qualities. All of these things, if you can put all these things together, you are going to be a successful creator, producer of media. And successful doesn't, remember, remember the motive mix. Successful could mean that you have more followers than anybody else. Successful could mean that you have 50 people that you create content for and that you and those 50 people interact with one another on a regular basis and you just dig one another. You enjoy one another. That's a successful social media creator. I want you to, to, to listen to something that I think captures all of these uh, characteristics of being a very effective um, sender, communicator of messages, and that's Vince Scully. Vince Scully is a baseball announcer. He's the announcer for the Los Angeles Dodgers. He's 81 years old. He's been announcing Dodger games for 60 years. So he started at 21 in Brooklyn, working with another legend, Red Barber, 
as a baseball announcer. He works by himself. If you want to, you, you can hear Vince Scully do a game, and what you will hear Vince Scully doing is alone, no color, no color commentators, nobody else, Vince Scully by himself doing the game. Here's an interview from, a clip of an interview from uh, the NewsHour uh, recently uh, that captures something about the way Vince Scully thinks about what he does. Who are you talking to when you're doing the game? I mean, you're, you're one of the few who still does it alone, you know, for the most part. So, who are you talking to? Well, first of all, uh, I have to make people understand it's not an ego thing. It's not that I just want to be on all by myself. This goes back to Brooklyn, where Red's... This. Nope. If I want to sell... Hang on a minute. I'll... Is it better for me to talk to you about the merits of the car? Or to... I want to try that again. I just, I didn't know if you could hear it. I really want you to hear the way, the way he speaks about his, his connection with people. Let's try it again. Who are you talking to when you're doing the game? I mean, you're, you're one of the few who still does it alone, you know, for the most part. So, who are you talking to? Well, first of all, uh, I have to make people understand it's not an ego thing. It's not that I just want to be on all by myself. This goes back to Brooklyn, where Red's philosophy was simply this. If I want to sell you a car, is it better for me to talk to you about the merits of the car? Or talk to cars <coughs> and have you listened to our discussion about the merits of the car? Red always felt that it was better to talk one-on-one. -on -one. So what I'm doing, I'm talking to the listener. And I will talk to the listener. By the way, I forgot to tell you. Or I forgot yeah, to tell you. Exactly. Yeah. Talking. Because I don't want the microphone to be in the way. I want them to know I'm sitting next to them in the ballpark talking. I want them to know I'm sitting next to them in the ballpark talking to them. Another line that if you can keep top of mind that no matter what kind of media you're producing, having that sense of you want people to feel like you're right there with them, talking with them, individually, connecting with them individually, that's the secret of being a great communicator in social media and as Vince Scully shows in any kind of media. Okay. Uh, the, um, so after all of this, the social media, the, the who is the who? So after a long day of producing all of this kind of content, uh, who are you? Who are you? At, at this point, I can sometimes sort of um, uh, empathize with uh, Alice here. And Alice is there with uh, the caterpillar who, who says, who are you? And Alice says, well, I, I don't. I hardly know at the present. I know who I was <laughs> when I got up this morning, um, but I think I must have changed several times since then. When we are creating media, in a, a pr production of content in a lot of different media, we change selves often during the day. You're on Twitter one minute and you're saying something funny and snarky to somebody because it just happened to be right in the flow. The next minute you're writing about something very serious on a blog. The next minute you're planning a podcast where you talk about something very near and dear to your heart. That means we are showing various profiles of ourselves. We are being various selves very much throughout the day, very much throughout the year, and now throughout our lives. And what we have now is a generation of people who are growing up used to being multiple selves in multiple contexts using multiple media every day and we don't know what that's going to do we just know that it's going to be a very different world with people who are used to connecting with others this way than it's been for those last 32,000. thanks but whoever i am i want to say thanks thanks i really enjoyed being here i don't know if we have a couple of minutes any questions anything anybody wants to ask um, talk to an audience that's very receptive to, to what it is that you're talking about, self-actualization of so many benefits. What about the rest of the population? Can you tie this in, for instance, with what Bill Duto said this morning? The resistance of people <coughs> to provide open access to information for the purpose of holding power. Sure. I, I think um, what we are seeing is that as we get used to living in a world in which information becomes the norm, when information becomes the norm, when it's no longer possible, for example, to think about going to buy a car without knowing what the price of that car really is, 
right? I mean, I, some of us are old enough to know that you'd go in and you'd look at the sticker price, and that was the only information that we had. The dealer loved it that way, right? But now, we've all become used to the fact that information is available to us all, and we won't go buy anything. We won't, not just a car, <laughs> now we won't buy anything without having the information available. I think government and many corporations are still learning the lessons that we're seeing uh, in those other kinds of settings. It's impossible to maintain credibility with people without this kind of transparency. So I think, I think those days are, are coming to an end, and like many of these changes, might come to an end very quickly. I think that's probably what we're going to see. And of course, with, with, uh, with leaders like Bill and others who are now growing up, remember, we have children who are going to be growing up in a world that says, well, what do you mean I can't get the permit for the park online and pay for it? That's insane. <laughs> so I think we're, we're seeing generational shifts of expectations that are going to make a big difference. Another question here. You talked an awful lot about content creation, and I was hoping that you might be able to um, talk a little bit about how, <laughs> I'm making the assumption that you're somewhat familiar with Forrester's research about how many people are creating content versus sure. watching the content, sure. Sure. and how important those people who might not be creating are to that experience. Yes, I, I subtly called them the audience in, in, the, in quotes here in the, in the talk because um, we still have, we know, many people, and this will always be the case, there will always be people who are much more comfortable uh, being the receivers of material rather than the producers of material. I think as we see in the Forrester research, those numbers are changing, and they're changing generationally, and they're changing again rather rapidly. So, uh, I. Sometimes people, those of us who have made a lot of content, are a little uh, impatient with people who are reluctant to create content. One of the reasons that my co-founders and I founded Vloggerheads was that we wanted to encourage shy people who, in the, in, in the YouTube world, when I was on the YouTube Community Council, what I got was all the complaints from people who were being attacked on YouTube. And, and YouTube, especially in 2000. 6, 2007 was the Wild West. It's still pretty wild. It was wilder then. So um, what we saw was it was very difficult to be someone who was shy, who had any kind of social um, hesitancy about them. Certainly if they had any, any disability of any kind, it was very difficult to create content. I think we're always going to have those percentages of people who are less comfortable. But once again, I think we're finding more and more people getting, getting more and more comfortable with it. And as children grow up in a world full of their own iPod, uh, their own iPhone uh, uh, camera worlds and their own video, I think that's going to change pretty dramatically as well. Yeah. What do you see as the opportunities for monetizing social media? Well. Um, I think they're, they're tremendous. I, I think um, uh, every, every business needs to understand that they live within the context of, uh, of the broader social world. And the broader social world is now connecting with itself very dramatically. Uh, we've been involved in several social media projects with our clients around helping them to connect and to make those connections not explicitly commercial with a lead uh, at, at the capital C, but we really want them to be more community oriented and then let the commercial meaning of their relationships start to come out. So I think in, in, the, in, a, in a very quick way, I think the opportunities for monetizing social media are, tr are tremendous. Okay, I think we should stop and uh, thanks again, really enjoyed uh, being here.